We had discussions here this morning of whether the world economy is going to take off with reasonably robust growth for the next few years. We heard a view that said uh, the recovery is more likely to peter out sometime next year and possibly even into a double dip recession. How much are you dependent on the course of those global economic events outside your control? How much do they affect the prospects? One of the things that we did um, in order to get ready for this November 4th ordeal was to effectively stress test the system. I mean, we had to find out what would happen if there, you know, in any one of the years in question, we would have suffered a severe decline in volumes. And we actually ran the model to 2000 of 2014 on the assumption that every year would be hit uh, by a 20% decline in volumes across the industry, and we survived the event. 20% um, decline from where they are now? 20% decline from a 2010 level, <clears throat> which assumes we're going to be effectively back at levels that you know we were at in the early part of the 2000s. I mean, the recovery of this business, and of Carson in particular, is going to be a gradual process. If anybody is expecting a miracle overnight, you won't see it. I mean, I hate to disappoint people that are waiting for these sort of phenomenal market share numbers coming out of Chrysler. You need to understand this. When we filed for bankruptcy uh, in the early part of this year, we were in there for less than 60 days. When we came out, <clears throat> we had exactly the same product portfolio that we did walking in. I mean, the bankruptcy judge had a huge amount of power in disposing of the matter, but it didn't create product. It didn't fix the quality issues. It didn't give me power trains. It didn't give me anything. So we walked out of this process cleaner, as I said, going through a washing machine, but we ended up with exactly the same stuff we had. <clears throat> so if you think that this organization, as committed as it is, and I, and I can tell you, I mean, I've been, I've been the CEO now, as I mentioned, for more than 15 years. I've rarely seen a group of people who are more committed than this. I, um, you know, the effort that's going on here is, is, is not to be underestimated. I mean, they know that they're on their last leg, right? They know that we're not, they're not going to get another chance. And so I, you can't ask more of them, honestly. I mean, I, and I think one has to be fair. I think that there's, I mentioned this in my interviews upstairs earlier, there appears to be almost this in, innate desire to try and, you know, f find the, sort of the fly in the ointment here. You will, we're not perfect. Right. We're going to continue to screw up. We just, the important thing is that you screw up less as you go forward, right? I mean, that's the real trick here. And I think we're screwing up a lot less than we were doing six months ago. I think the quality of the product that's coming out of the process now is structurally superior. And it's going to improve substantially as we revamp the product line. That, you know, 75% of what we sell today will have been touched in some significant way between now and November of 2010. The Fiat 500 was a notion in somebody's head when I came out of bankruptcy in June. It will be produced in November of 2010. It's less than 18 months, right? It's never happened in American car history, ever. So you can criticize the process. You can, you know, we can sit back and throw a lot of darts at this and say, you guys are not going to make it. No, I think we'll, 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 we'll find out. I mean, you know, we're engaged. I mean, more than this we cannot do, right? And, I, and you know, the commitment to pay everybody back by 2014 is a huge step. I mean, it's not, uh, you know, we've run the numbers. We, look, we, we actually broke even in the month of September. We broke even in the month of October. I mean, Jim Blanchard sits on our board. He knows this. I mean, you know, we're, we're cheap. We're running a pretty tight house. We're not overspending. I mean, you know, every ounce, every dollar that we spend on advertising is heavily weighed. You know, we're not spending unnecessarily. We, one of the things we've done is that we stopped incentivizing sales to the point where it degraded brand equity and product. And that's one thing that became the going theme here in 2008, right? Everybody just scanned to the hell out of the stuff. So, you know, and I know we have a, a, a big dealer in the room here, but if you're expecting me to call you up and tell you that we'll give you a $6,000 check to move the vehicle, you won't get the call. <laughs> I hate to disappoint your Christmas expectations, but it's also the wrong answer, right? You just, if, if, you're gonna do, if you're gonna sell a product on price, then it's no use running commercials, right? It's no use creating brand equity, just don't bother. Stay home, as the, you know, a guy, a guy used to run G appliances in Europe, you know, he walked into his office one day, he, he called his HR guy and he said, do me a favor, fire, fire the marketing department. And the guy said, no, I understand, who? 
He goes, no, you don't understand me. Fire the marketing department. Like the whole thing, right? And if we're going to sell cars on price, I don't need all this stuff. I've just turned this into a, a phenomenally efficient distribution machine that will make the, you know, the thing at the lowest possible price. And I'll still make my margins, but I also don't need him to have all the premises that he has. I don't need him to invest in customer service. And Americans don't buy cars on the basis of price. There's more to, there's more to life than this. It's a package of services, right? And I think that we need to improve them all. Our customer, ser our customer service capabilities today are not even comparable to what they were like in June. Right? I mean, I get complaints from customers, believe it or not, I actually do get some. Um, they get answered within four hours. Doesn't mean that I, you know, everybody who sends me a letter gets a new car. Um, <laughs> you can try it, but, um, <laughs> but it just says that the organization is turned it is turned towards the customer again, and we know this. Like this is not you don't have to go to Harvard to figure this out, right? I mean, it's really simple stuff. You need a customer base to sell cars to. We need to go back and nurture them, and we're doing this a piece at a time. Speaking of price, let me ask you another question and really push a little further on a central point you made at the outset of your speech. You talked about the need to rationalize the industry. It's basically got 50% more capacity than is needed. Yeah. You extolled the uh, steps the U.S. has taken yeah. to cut back capacity here. You were equally at least pessimistic about Europe. Indeed, to the contrary, Europe has been subsidizing and seeking to keep business in place. You didn't mention the fact that new competitors are coming into the picture, China, India, new countries coming in, new companies, increased capacity. What is the answer to that fundamental question for the global economy, not to mention for your own company? Well, look, you know, look, there was a, at least half the morning that was devoted to China. Right? You, you need to understand that when you're running a country with 1.3 million people, and this year, but somebody mentioned that they were actually the largest car market in the world. They hit the number overnight. I think they're going to sell 12 million. They sold 12 million cars to the end of November. So they are now the biggest car market in the world, period. Europe is incremental volume to them. And until you get this through your head, right, when you look at production capacity in Europe and you start saying to yourself, I think I've you know, I've rationalized the infrastructure, I'm as competitive as I can be. You only have to look at the margin. This business here is incredibly sensitive to volume, right? This is the true, you know, if you have to design a case for operating leverage, the car business is the classic case because it has tremendous operating leverage. Moving 100,000 vehicles off a base of a million can mint money at the other end and it could destroy you on 100,000 less. So if that argument is true, and we've lived it on our skin, right? We've lived it through Fiat and we're living it through Chrysler now. If that argument is true, we should all be collectively very concerned about the Chinese coming into Europe and effectively using an operating base which is as large as theirs is to effectively uh, wipe out the competitiveness of, of the European car industry. So I've argued a couple of things. One is that Europe needs to rationalize its operating infrastructure. It needs to do it. And by the way, I'm not, as much as I like President Obama, because I think he's really phenomenally changed the way in which the world looks at the U.S. It, much, and, and I back the way in which, and I understand why he <coughs> intervened and he did what, what he did with the car industry. I'm not advocating that Europe use the same system to get it done. There are alternative ways to bring about that rationalization. But Europe needs to embrace it, and we need to take that capacity out, and we need to do it constructively, and being fully, completely socially responsible for the consequences of those choices. We need to do it. And we need to forget about the boundaries between ourselves and France and Germany, because this issue is an incredibly short-lived discussion. What the French have done now by providing support to the two national auto automakers is is unique. <laughs> you know, we signed, the blood, we signed the bloody treaty of Rome back in the 50s. There was a very clear understanding of the common market. We know that we cannot play favorites, right? So you, that's the rule. Right? It's not complicated. And so what you can't do is you can't tie support to the fact that you, you keep production within the boundaries. 
which is the reason why the deal with Opel failed, because it was constructed by the German government in order to support and maintain local production. So Brussels, even though from time, from time to time it appears to be ineffective, actually intervened and forced the deal back into, the Amer into American hands, which I also think is the right answer, and it brings me to the second point, which says that in order to be successful in this business, you need mass. I need to have incredibly efficient volume, I need to be an incredibly efficient volume producer. I targeted a million cars per architecture. I'm wrong, the number is 900, I don't care, a million five. But the number is of that magnitude and when you look around the world, with the exception of Toyota today, um, and maybe in some cases Ford, there's nobody else who's capable of producing that kind of volume off the base. GM potentially could have done it when it was a nine million car a year producer. Right? When they were the biggest car maker in the world, they could have done it. For whatever reason, and I'm not criticizing past management, it never happened because the, the, the regional structures that exist around GM kept power away from the center. But you need to turn this into a truly efficient industrial machine. 80% of the architecture that sits underneath these cars is never seen by a customer. You will never see it. And to, and to, and, and to cater to, dif to, to differentiate the products at that level with the capital costs associated in producing that level of differentiation is absolute nonsense. When people buy a 1.2 liter engine in Europe, 1.2 liter, right? We're talking about, I don't know how many cubic inches of that. It's, you probably use it for lawnmowers here. But 1.2 1, 1 liter engine, nobody particularly cares whether I make it or whether I make it with you or somebody else. They need a reliable, fuel efficient, eco-friendly engine and there's no reason why I could not do this across three car makers and effectively share the cost of the development and the manufacturer. And there's absolutely no reason. Nobody cares except for the three crazy engineers that commit to half a billion or 750 million euros to do the engine. And then in order to keep that investment alive, in order to, your, the price of the vehicle goes right through the roof, right? The marginal cost on an engine production line, I mean, I won't try and take you through this, right? I mean, we do live by numbers. We understand this. We know what happens to unit prices as you drive volumes, right? The cost of these investments disappears on a per unit basis if you can drive enough volume through. And, and the, this industry has not done it. It's allowed for a pro proliferation of engines, a proliferation of powertrains, proliferation of architectures. And this cannot be. Because if it's true that the Chinese are coming, let's just assume that we're going to develop that as a nightmare scenario. If they are coming, the only answer to that threat, forget about where the exchange rate will be, which I'll leave that to you to divide. But forget about where the exchange rate will be. I mean, you need to drive the most efficient machine you can drive. There's nothing else. It's the only weapon you have. They're going to be faster than we are, by definition. So either you start buying into that notion of efficiency and forget all the other stuff that you've been telling yourself for 20 years that was really important, or you're finished. So I'm not here to call the death of the car industry. I just think we need to change our spots. Who, who are your benchmarks today? What companies, prior to your own getting up to that level that you're obviously intending to achieve, would you view as the, uh, the best practices? I ask that in part because you've mentioned the Asians a couple of times. You just mentioned Toyota. But we know within Asia there are important differences now. And even Toyota has lost some market share and it's of worrying about the rise of Hyundai and the Koreans. Um, who, who's setting the pace out there right now? And why are they so successful? Just in terms of positioning brands, probably the Koreans have done the best job over the last five years. I mean, if you had asked me five years ago whether Hyundai would be where it is in the U.S., I would have just ignored you, um, which would have been a fatal mistake. Um, they're alive and kicking. I think they've done a great job of positioning the brand. Kia is not a bad example of somebody you can do. Still, from an industrial standpoint, the best developer of cars is still Toyota, by far. I mean, you know, there, there are, you know, this is gossip, but, you know, there are stories about the fact that if you want to introduce a different horn, a, a different type of horn in a car, you've got to go see the chairman of Toyota. Right? 
the level of standardization, the belief in standardization is so, so deep in the organization that if you want to change the horn, you got to go see the chairman. <coughs> because by the way, that is another useless differentiation, right? When was the last time you bought a car because you didn't like the sound of the horn? <laughs> and I can tell you within Fiat, we probably have 25 of them. <laughs> Every time you retool a horn, you start from scratch. Car, American car makers are even worse. So all this stuff needs to come out, right? Very quietly, you just keep on taking out the complexity from the system and focusing on what's really important. Okay, let me open the floor to questions, comments, discussions, and advice for how Fiat Chrysler can advice. achieve the goals. Advice I'll take. Advice he will take. Okay, uh, let me uh, go back here first. We've got traveling mics. Uh, please identify yourself, say where you're from, and uh, then fire away. First here, then second back at the microphone. Thank you. Neil Rowland with Automotive News. Uh, two questions related to dealers, please. First, what are your plans with regard to opening new points in the United States? And second, on, any comment on the uh, congressional legislation being developed over the weekend to come up with third-party arbitration for rejected dealers using criteria more favorable to dealers than what Chrysler has advanced. I don't want to comment on the last piece of legislation. I'm, I haven't even seen it, although I've got our, our Washington guru here in the room, and he's just violently advising me not, not to comment because I don't know anything about it. And he, it's a wise suggestion, and I'll follow it. I can, only, I can only tell you that our position on the, um, the, on the reje so-called rejected dealer issue um, I think is incredibly equitable. I mean, we've opened up the process. We've acknowledged the fact that if by applying our standards we made a mistake, that we will reinstate the dealer. I mean, and, and more than this we cannot do. I mean, it's a fair, fair solution to what has been, I think, an unnecessarily thorny issue. But I think that we've taken the right measures, and I think our position in General Motors on this are absolutely consistent, and it should make the matter go away. On the, on the first question that you asked about whether we're, we're, we're going to open up the dealerships, I mean, the question about open points is always it, it's a never-ending story within any car industry, any car business. And see, we continue to look at the map. A lot of the stuff depends on what product comes out of the pipeline that may make a presence in a particular market more relevant than others. If tomorrow, I mean, we're already lar large in trucks, but if we wanted to be large in trucks tomorrow and the product pipeline came in, if you were not in Texas, you'd be nobody. So, I mean, we're going to follow product development and occupy those areas as required. But there are no grand plans here to go out there and refill the U.S. landscape with new dealers. It's part of a gradual filling in process that's going to remedy some problems that have emerged more out of the product portfolio than anything else. Mary, was that, was that helpful? Yes. Can you be more specific about numbers? <laughs> I don't have numbers. As I told you, it's a gradual process. I mean, talk, ask me in three years. I can tell you we started this process at FIA back in 2004, and that map has drastically changed over the last five years, completely. As we moved east in <clears throat> Eastern Europe, We've done the same thing in Latin America. This is a continuously evolving piece. So just work with us and you'll see it happen. Barry. Barry Wood, freelance correspondent. Uh, Mr. Marchioni, uh, I think it was a Deutsche Bank analyst who said uh, in the Toronto Star that uh, concerning the strategy of selling Fiat 500s in the U.S., that if you tried to buy one in a few years' time in Kansas City, you'd be shot. And I'm just wondering, doesn't that idea that uh, oversized Americans are going to buy small Italian designed cars require a very substantial gasoline tax? I've got a second so element let, to that let question. Me, let me try and deal with your first question. I don't know whether the comment about a 500 in Kansas City was a derogatory remark about a 500 or Kansas. So I'm. Not, <laughs> so, I'm just going. I'm, I'm going to ignore the Kansas reference, and I'll take all the blame on the 500 <laughs> side. I think that one of the things that I said when we introduced the 500 concept in the U.S. is that that car was never going to be a universal American car, 
and that it was going to have distribution in particular areas in the United States. There, were, there are some areas that are better than others to absorb a 500. I actually don't see a 500 in the middle of Texas. I, I mean, you pick Kansas, I'm going to pick on Texas. Um, but having said this, I think that there's, you know, and even the volume aspirations that we, have, that we have for the 500 reflect that limited distribution uh, mechanism. You, by the way, the other thing that you won't find a lot of in Kansas is a Mini Cooper, to be perfectly honest. So let's not go throw out the baby with the bathwater. I think the cars are designed to deal with partic particular requirements of a customer based by geography, and we'll follow those lines. The other thing that you asked me was what? Yes. Fuel tax? Since you're relatively new to the auto industry and you've got plants in Poland, Brazil, Mexico, the U.S., Canada, etc., Italy, what have you learned in terms of what makes an efficient auto factory? Is it capital investment, the newness of the plant? Is it the flexibility of trade union operations? Is it proximity to market? What have you learned? Well, actually, it's not proximity to market. We start knocking off the things that they are not. Um, I think that realistic, uh, the realistic tailoring of the capital investment based on volume aspirations is key. Most of the car makers overbuild capacity by definition. They always think they're going to sell more cars than they ever do. So they tool the plant for three times what they actually sell. Um, and the other thing has to do with the way in which we manufacture vehicles the actual philosophy that we use in the manufacturing process. And that's probably been the biggest change um, to Fiat in the last five years, because we have embraced an, an evolved Toyota production system as part of our culture in Fiat. We've, you know, we've taken a Toyota base and developed it from there. Um, so some of the things, I mean, Dave, David earlier passed me a sort of amusing cartoon about where Fiat was 50 years ago from a quality standpoint. We don't do cars like that. If you want to, you can buy it as an option, but we don't do them anymore. You know, the level of quality that's coming out of our vehicles today is nothing to be embarrassed about. And in the majority of our cases, certainly with the new architectures that we've launched since 2004, they're, they're a par with the Asian competition. So um, I think we've got Miles Chrysler needs to close that gap pretty quickly. It is not to the safe stage of development. Um, and that's why I think, you know, somebody asked me earlier, I mean, we have a large number of people on the ground here who are pure, pure, purely temporary help to help bridge that, the now to the future. So they're here, there's 50, 75 people that come in and come out. There are people that are flying over to Europe to see how our factories are running to try and effectively emulate this manufacturing process, which we consider to be at the heart of the quality resolution issues for, for Fiat. Dave. Thank you for your comments. Um, global leaders are in Copenhagen uh, the next few weeks uh, discussing climate change, uh, CO2 targets. Uh, here in the United States, uh, President Obama led an effort uh, engaging with the automakers to set some targets on increasing fuel economy by 40 percent. Your experience in Europe with uh, the EU, uh, and SEA, and, and others, what message would you give government or ask government to consider with regard to establishing these targets, which is becoming more of a global problem and challenge, and how, as we as automakers, can best meet those targets and effectively still remain competitive and produce the products that consumers want? Well, since you've got me harping on Brussels now, let's continue. Um, I've been incredibly vocal on this issue with Brussels because I, I had the unfortunate uh, obligation to be the chairman of the SEA for two years, and I was there when the, certainly a big piece of the legislation on CO2 reduction was introduced. And I've been vocal both with Brussels and with the national governments in Europe about being absolutely re realistic about the impositions that they were making on the car industry. One of the things that we've told, and I don't have the exact number here, but um, the amount of CO2 reduction which will be achieved as a result of the new regulations in Europe, and which will become effective on a full penalty basis when you go over the limits by 2015, is thousands of a percentage of the total CO2 emission on a global scale. So when you look at the cost efficiency um, curve and you, look, and you find that for a dollar spent, how would I have gotten a better reduction on CO2? This is the least efficient way to get to that number. 
there's a, for a variety of reasons. One of the biggest problems that sits in Europe, and there are similar examples here, is that there is a large pool of vehicles which is, because of their age, are effectively emitting CO2 on a multiple basis of new cars. And if you really want to be balanced in all this, you would have phased out those objectives over a long period of time and incentivized people effectively, even on a penalty basis, to take those vehicles off the road. And I've heard all the arguments, pros and against that, are, that view, including the fact that this is, you know, it, it, forces, it, it forces a change into people that maybe cannot afford to change, right? If you're driving a 1952 car, right, which happens to be there, I was born, if, um, if you're still driving one today, um, being forced to change a vehicle for emission regulations may not be fair because you can't afford to make the change. My advice to you is, I, you know, actually you can provide support mechanisms to allow people to make that transition. But if you want to have a, a true, large, immediate impact on CO2 emissions, the way you do this is by effectively renewing the fleet a lot faster than you're renewing it. You need to take the old stuff off the road. And it's, and it's especially true for commercial vehicles, we're probably the largest polluters. So I will be very, very careful about introducing new legislation that imposes limits on new cars that leave such a wide difference between the old fleets and the new ones. They're cost ineffective. But having said this, we all need to get there. So I don't think the industry is objecting. We're going to get there. The time frames may not coincide. And especially at times of uncertainty like this in Europe, where you've got 30% over capacity. You're going to sit back and you're going to say, what are, you, what are you going to do in an environment where the cost of the unit keeps on going up and volume is going down? All right. Who finances this industry unless there's a structural change? But it, sound, but it sounds like from your first part of your answer, you'd like to make cash for clunkers permanent. No, I actually think that what well, you need, well, can, Let's get the cash for clunkers thing off the table because that was a President Obama thing. And I don't know what drove that decision. Well, or equivalents in other countries, though, because the other equivalent countries. of the removal, the removal of polluting vehicles off the road, right? The ones that have got a multiple of emissions compared to today. You want to be truly effective, take, those, take that stuff off the, off the road. So make, it's, it's so make that incentive. So make that incentive. It helps industry in providing additional volumes to try and get this machine going. But you need to get them off the road. All right. Uh, a bit of back. Jacob. Jacob Kierkegaard from the Peterson Institute. Can I just follow up on the previous question and ask you, what do you see the role for uh, electric cars, uh, non sort of standard fossil fuel cars? Uh, just not just for Chrysler, but for the industry as a whole going forward, obviously in the light of what's happening right now uh, in Copenhagen? I think electric cars are going to continue to play a significant role in the mix of technologies that are available to the car buyer. I think that there are today, given where technology sits on electric vehicles, there are significant um, deficiencies in an electric vehicle that will not satisfy all re requisites of a normal car for most people. And so until we, and they're not complicated, I mean fundamentally we know how to build them, we know how to build the electric motors. The, 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 the huge block for all of us is the storage of energy, right? Where do you store the energy and how long does the energy last? If we could develop a vehicle that effectively could recharge in 15 minutes and drive 400 miles, you'd be able to own the market, right? I mean in an ideal world. We don't have the technology available today. I also understand the administration interest in developing the know-how and the technology in this country. We are working and we continue to work because the MV, regardless of what some people have said in the press, I mean the MV section of Chrysler continues to exist and performs well, but it's part of our powertrain division because it cannot be the freak element, right? It needs to be part of a coordinated effort to bring down CO2 emissions and to improve efficiency. You need to find a way to make electric vehicles coexist with the rest of the combustion world. One of the things that I, I and it's, I, I, we've also been public on this because of what Fiat has done in the past, is that I think you need to become fossil fuel neutral on these items, right? You can't pick petroleum and, and whack the hell out of it and say, you know, that's no good, electric is the right answer. We are the biggest producer of CNG vehicles, um, of CNG vehicles in Europe. We have a large 
a large production of tetrafuel solutions in, in, in Latin America that uses ethanol, uses gas. And, and we need to be creative enough and let industry come up with its own set of solutions that bring down emissions and improve, and improve consumption. But all of these things need to be left to industry to develop. I don't think you can bias the choice. And some of these choices are available a lot faster and have an immediate impact um, on, on consumption and on emissions as opposed to the electric vehicles, which I think are going, are going to take a much longer time to, to develop. I think we need to continue to make the commitment that the solution is not around the corner. Jim Holland. Want to go with that mic? Thank you for uh, a very inspiring picture of what's going to happen with Fiat and with Chrysler uh, in, the, in the coming years. It wasn't quite clear to me if you felt that uh, the rest of the industry would be able to resolve this overcapacity problem. I wonder if you could talk about that a little more uh, in terms of yes or no. But I really wanted to ask you to bring the Russian car industry and market into the international conversation that you started. And you mentioned the Opal case, one that you have a particular insight into. Um, and you talked about how, in general, political influences are greatly complicating the effort to rationalize the car industry. Could you talk a little bit about the Opal case, flesh out the decision as you understand it to uh, not go forward with the deal that was the German government had pushed for, and talk about the effect of that not going forward on the Russian car industry and the Russian market, whether or not uh, there was a strong political dimension in that. Thank you. <laughs> Simple question. Um, let, let's deal with the capacity issue first. The U.S. has cured the problem. I think you need to understand this because otherwise we're going to be debating. I was asked a question by some interviewer upstairs earlier. The Chapter 11 process has created old co and new co's, right? I mean, there's a, an existing company and one that was left behind. The, the one that's been left behind is saddled, unfortunately, with what I call redundant or excess production capacity, which will not be used in the new world. So both ourselves and General Motors are coming out of, the washing, out of this washing cycle clean with no overhang. And what was taken out even before the Chapter 11 process by all companies involved, including Chrysler, which took out production right through 2008 and 2007, um, that capacity has shrunk. And as a, as a matter of fact, Chrysler is now in the enviable position of having to choose how and where and when to increase capacity. Not because I'm I'm suicidal, right? Because of the fact that I actually think that we need to, you know, I need a production base to try and deal with some of, the, some of these products that are coming to market, and I don't have it. Um, and so I'm okay with the U.S. The European side is a much more difficult issue. Europe, on the overcapacity side, overcapacity, you know, there hasn't been one car factory that has been shut in Germany since the war. Not one. Actually, it goes back to before the wars, 1937 or 1936. I need to go back and check exactly. And it's impossible, right? We've, I know we've all had a capacity since. But it's impossible there's got to be one plant that, by definition, became obsolete because of technology, location, and so on. I know that we've got plant. If I had to redesign the industrial landscape of Fiat today, I would never build the plants where they are. Never. I mean, some of those choices reflect a variety of things, yeah, which I, you know, even with the deepest respect for the people that made the choice at the time, you know, stretched the limits of credulity on the basis of industrial efficiency. So if I to redo it, I'd do it differently. You can imagine what would have happened in Germany, right? I mean, especially given, you know, the time frame. So Europe needs to embrace this and take this on. It needs to say, I'm going to take this out, right? And this needs to be a, Euro, a European community-driven decision. It cannot, you cannot leave it to the national governments to bring it about because it will not happen. And so this ties me back to, ties me to the Opal issue, which is, in its, you know, even on published accounts, the Opal story was a question of labor unions, the German government, playing an active role in saving Opel from what would have been a, 
a bankruptcy and effectively did file for some type of administration. The problem with the Opal deal is that it happened at the same time that General Motors in the United States was going through its own unst. So it was going through its own um, sort of restructuring process. It was, it was we're getting ready to file. There were management changes made. And the, the, the two events were effectively running in parallel. And the American organization, I, I would suspect, probably had no time to try and deal with this small European problem. And so it allowed, as it does in all European situations, it allowed for the European national government to step in and play a role and try and save what it could out of the spoil. So the, the construct that came out of this, which involved a Canadian parts maker, right, like Magna, a, a, the, a, a Russian bank, an investment bank, and the German government to construct a solution to an automotive problem which, if I'm right, requires volume, distribution, and so on, looked at least on paper to be what I call deficient in a, a whole pile of parts. I mean, just, you know, you're missing the necessary ingredients to run a successful business because you need large platforms, which can only lead, to, lead you to believe that there must have been, as part of the plans, an, industri an industrial solution to the Russian side that would have said, I would have been able to get to a million vehicles out of an existing Opal platform in the Russian market. That situation, and I'm not, in, I'm not inside General Motors, so it's a question you should direct of them, but if I'd been in their shoes, the question about intellectual, the intellectual property associated with that architecture, the powertrains, and all the other additional level of dislocations that it would have created to the rest of the GM organization would have pushed me not to go in that direction, by instinct. The Fiat solution, would have made that issue go away. Because the Fiat solution would effectively have replaced those platforms with Fiat derived platforms and effectively made the reliance on GM know how and technology unnecessary. They, they may also not have been liked in Detroit as a solution. So it was a complicated story in which the government and the unions played what I consider to be an exorbitant and unjustified role and all of which got redimensioned by the desire of General Motors to retain the asset, which I think, you know, to be absolutely consistent with the arguments that I've pitched so far, is the right answer for the car industry. It needs to be owned by a global auto manufacturer. Forget about the fact that I didn't get it, but I much prefer, no, but I much prefer for a reliable guy, a reliable global guy, to run their business and try and deal with competition on a level, level playing field basis than to try and deal with distorted markets. I don't like them. Okay, next one in the back. Uh, Joe Minerick, Committee for Economic Development. Uh, three things. Uh, number one, 72 cubic inches. 1.2 liter engine is 72 cubic inches. Thank you. Uh, number two. Um, I used to be able to do this when I was younger. I can't. I'm just getting too long. Um, there have been international alliances of auto manufacturers before, Chrysler and Mitsubishi, for example. Now, what you're doing is significantly different from that, but I wonder uh, your observations on what you can do to make that work when in the past it, it was not arguably not effective. And then number three, possibly interacting with number two, some car people will say that part of the reason why you can't use product easily across national borders is an array of trivial regulatory differences, sizes of license plates, heights of bumpers, horns, et cetera. I wonder if you have any observations on that and how you can make that work with Fiat and Chrysler. Give you, give you, let me try and deal with the third question. The difference in the development of a car to accommodate a different size license plate as we're doing in the Fiat 500, it's probably about 10 million bucks to do a front bumper and a back door. And if I put the license plate on the two bumpers, it's less than 7 million. So before I start cutting, slashing my wrists on the fact that I need to accommodate a different size license plate, maybe just let's try to try and find the right place to put it so I don't, I don't have to redesign the whole car. There's no, not a single doubt that the the fact that we've got multiplied levels of government regulations across jurisdictions on these issues, that 
The regulations being in Canada and the US are not the same, and we're just across the border, right? It's just shocking. Um, if we could harmonize all these regulations, it would make my arguments even more, um, more valid. Having said this, the, the incremental cost of homologating a car for US purposes out of a European base is maybe significant if the car is in existence. It's almost irrelevant if it's a design stage because I can design the diversity inside the process, right? So there are differences. I think we know how to deal with them. So I don't buy the argument that they're, they're sort of huge roadblocks. They're, they're a pain, but they can be dealt with. Um, the second question was an international, I'm just trying to remember, I'm trying to work my way back. No, you asked me why the Mitsubishi thing and what is so different. You know, when, if you go back to the comments that I made, I mean, I, you know, when I started preaching and I made reference to this notion about Clinton, I mean, these, the, what I talked about reflect a set of cultural values about how you run organizations. I've never met the Japanese house that would even understand remotely what that is, and I can tell you right now that the, the, the way in which President, President Clinton um, spoke at the labor conference in Blackpool is something which is not translatable into German. So I think that things work when organizations are culturally ready, ready to embrace the interface. And if they're not, one of the few advantages of my being on both sides of this equation is the fact that I grew up n north of the border here and I feel it totally at home in the United States. And so I, I, can, I, I play bridge all the time. And I can force the porosity of the walls between fiat and here. Nothing gets caught in paperwork. Whatever fiat has is available to Chrysler. I don't have to go ask a CEO unless I turn into somewhat of a schizophrenic behavior, which I've done from time to time, especially when I see market share that. But um, I think that the real issue is, is that these organizations now are actually, I mean, they're operating in, in a completely transparent world. And the people that are moving around across the organizations, although we recognize the, diff, the, you know, the, the fact that they belong to two separate legal organizations, and we have a, a different set of obligations. The industrial piece of this, the way in which we're going to design the architectures and move this business forward is totally shared. And that's what makes it viable, right? The cultural divide, that's why I talked about this, is gone. And it's part of what this council is doing, right? I mean, you know, the meeting today, this morning, even tonight, is designed to break down those barriers. And it's interesting when you talk to some of the Italian members of the, of the contingent here, right? When they come here, there's almost a sense of relief, a collective relief about the openness of the environment within which we function. And the fact that we're actually do, do, dealing with issues as opposed to nonsense, right? Which is, appears to be a European habit, so. Um, <laughs> you know. We have a question over here from one of the members of the European, of the council. But she's moved to Washington. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we'll still count her. I, I live acro across the ocean. Now, first of all, thank you for the speech. And I, as an Italian, also thank you for your work, because I think that if you succeed, you've done more for the image of Italy in this country than hundreds of thousands of meetings of any sort, especially because of the kind of business you are. Not, you're not fashion, where everybody expects Italians to be ex exceeding, <laughs> excelling. I, if, you, if I may, you mentioned, just mentioned that you are CEO of both companies. And Listening to you, my understanding is leadership is a very key factor in the success of your, of your work. So if I may ask you a more personal question, how do you manage? I mean, how much do you do here? How much do you do there? How do you manage being an effective CEO of both, co both companies in, in practical okay, well, terms? Okay, let's get a couple. Of, the Internal Revenue Service has its set office in Washington, D.C. And by definition, one, I spend less than 183 days. I hope you're taking notes of this. I spend less than 183 days in this jurisdiction. Um, I, look, I, right now, I work seven days a week, and I work 24-7. And so I came in yesterday morning out of, out of um, I came into Detroit yesterday morning. We worked all day, and I came into Washington today. I'm off to New York tomorrow. And, you know, I mean, that's all I do. 
and it's okay. You can do this for a period of time. And I think we made a commitment to the organ to both organizations that, because I'm unfortunate, as I said earlier, I'm the only one that can guarantee the transfer. Right? There's got to be this sort of this blood transfusion that needs to happen at the speed of light. And if I don't, you know, I need to be on both sides to make sure that the pipes are flowing. Um, they cannot go off forever. So hopefully, you know, certainly within the next 24 months, we'll find a more permanent solution, either there or here. And I'm not threatening the Italian side with departure from Italy, but I'm just, we need to find a solution to this issue. Um, this, the notion of, if I can just go back, you brought up this issue about leadership. One of the things that unfortunately has happened in this country, when I was young and foolish and I was growing up, I, I'm just older and foolish now, but you know, one of the people that I used to admire a lot was Jack Welch. And the reason why I admired him, he was on the board of Fiat for a long period of time. I met him after I, after I started doing my career as a CEO. I never tried to emulate him because I, you can't emulate people, right? I just, it's nuts. Um, but one of the things that I, one of the very few people that kept on consistently talking about the value of leadership in this country was Jack. Um, and in that sense, we've lost all this. We've actually been caught up in a whole pile of discussions about technocracy and exchange rates and, and too, big, too big to fail arguments about banks and so on, which have, you know, when you, when you lead an organization with 230,000 people and, and, you, and you step back and the only thing you need to deal with is, that, is, is, is technocracy. It takes all the joy of leading out of it. These, being a, a CEO, being a leader in these places, is a trust. If you violate those princ basic principles of trust, you failed. We've lost all this. We've lost the notion, the, all the romance, all the charisma associated with being a leader. It's it, the best job on the face of the earth and the worst at the same time. There's not, but there's no, nothing to replace it. And in the discussions this, that we had this morning for three or four hours, we talked about everything except what really matters. And at the end of the day, we all entrust our collective lives into the hands of some leaders who make some fundamental decisions about the quality of our lives going forward. And at a corporate level, there's not enough time spent looking at those people to find out whether we should ever entrust them, those people to be led, ever. I sit on boards, I mean, I, I'm on the board of a, competitor bank to some of the friends in the room here. And I've lived through this, through this process of leadership succession. N this issue has never, never, ever come up. You know, there are very few bankers in the world that given what's happened, one would instinctively gravitate to. <laughs> Being careful. But th there are some. But there are very few that one would instinctively gravitate to. And the problem that we've got with this is that I, you know, that somehow in the last 10, 15 years, we've lost, we've got these two issues all screwed up, right? Leadership, values, you know, you know the, the profession of being a leader with compensation, excess remuneration, stock options, exorbitant lifestyles, abuse of power, abuse of rights. When people do this, you pick the wrong guy. I mean, it's not that complicated, right? You just hired a guy who ethically, morally, should not have been a leader. And it's that simple, right? I don't know whether that was helpful. That, that's very helpful. <laughs> Uri? <laughs> One more question. Yeah, uh, Uri Dadush with the Carnegie Endowment. I take it back to economics, if I can, for a sure. second. I live there too. <laughs> uh, two related questions. One is, I'm curious as the CEO of a multinational company, whether you think that tariff barriers, either in the developed or the developing world, are still playing a significant role in fashioning the strategy or in affecting your business, tariff barriers. Um, and the uh, second question, which is somewhat related, is I'd love to hear an explanation of why uh, car prices are so much higher in a, in a traded sector, cars, why uh, they're so much higher in Europe uh, today and have been for a while uh, than in the United States. Um, let me deal with the tariff side first. 
they do play a role in, in the choices that we make. And they do make a role in terms of where we choose produ production sites. And one of the reasons, for example, why the 500 is being built in, in Mexico by Chrysler for the benefit of the US, Canadian, and Mexican organization is because of the free trade agreement that exists between Mexico and Latin America. So these cars that have a marketplace in Brazil will be able to flow into the country on a duty-free basis. So we look at this all the time. There are things, and, and they will continue to bias, they will continue to bias our choices. They're important. So the work that's happening at WTO, all the work that Pascal Lamy has done are things that we follow in our choice. There are aberrations to this process, which are, you know, to use an, an overused term, stretch the limit of fragility. This, latest round of ratification that's being required here in the U.S. on, on the free trade agreement with South, South Korea is something which, you know, I, I, I must have missed a big chunk of the discussion because I really, it makes absolutely no sense to me. And the Europeans are embraced in the same type of snake dance with this concept, which has passed even some senior levels of the Commission on a basis which I really do not understand. I mean, I do not know of a person and I'm not trying to pick on the Koreans. I do not know of a person who has gone to Korea as a businessman and thinks that he's had free, unrestricted access to that market. I don't know of one person. And so to treat, to, to allow for this unbalanced treatment of, of, of trade is something which is fundamentally criminal. So I think, you know, we, we can't do it. We shouldn't. I hope we don't do it here. And I've been pushing like hell not to get it done in Europe. So that's one issue. To go back to um, the other question you asked me about car prices. There are, the American, this has to do with size and market efficiency and the perception of brands and position. The North American markets have their own pricing mechanism. They just, they really do, they reflect different Different, different available, disposable income, different valuation of the premiumness of a brand. And if you try and play, play outside those boundaries, you will sell nothing in this country. It's all been tried. So if you try to buy an S-Class in the United States and charge the same prices that you will be paying in Germany, you will sell one. It's a completely different argument when you're talking about truly premium brands. Like, I mean, the Ferraris of the world. Right, have their own. They have their own cadence, cadence, their own demand function. Those things are totally unperturbed by pricing and exchange rates. They don't care. Right, we only make five thousand two hundred a year. Right, so how wrong could you be? But everybody else who's yet either a mass producer or a quasi mass producer, even at the premium end of the spectrum, faces market dynamics here which are a lot more competitive than they are in Europe. Right, the big battle in Europe is thought to the A and B segment at the other end where I play. Right? I and Peugeot, Citroën, and Renault, and even to some extent Volkswagen. The big battle is in that area. The other ones are totally outside of it. Is okay, that, we have to resume the meeting of the council. So I want to thank all of you for coming. Sergio, thank you for a brilliant and candid presentation. <laughs>